Jimi Hendrix changes managers on September 17th, 1970. The next day, he's found dead with wine coming out of his mouth and out of his nose. Doctors found very little alcohol content in his blood. Highly intoxicated on barbiturates, someone could have easily drowned him by force ingestion, a common torture tactic by intelligent agencies like Britain's M16, which Jimi Hendrix's manager, Michael Jeffrey, was a part of. Jeffrey had a life insurance policy out on Hendrix, and if Hendrix would have switched managers, Jeffrey would have been exposed for years of embezzlement. Three years later, Jeffrey mysteriously dies in a plane crash. His remains were never found. All right, welcome to the Goza podcast where we talk about everything rock and roll. Subscribe to our channel and go check out our original music. Now, hang on. I thought you said that Jimi Hendrix's manager was that guy from The Animals. Initially, yes. Chaz Chandler, the bass player of The Animals, he found Jimi Hendrix in America, took him to the UK, and they needed some financial backing. So in comes Michael Jeffrey. And Michael Jeffrey is an interesting character, to say the least, okay? For one... He, he was a spy for Britain, okay? And then for two, he worked under, he learned all of his music business stuff from Don Arden. Who's that? Don Arden is Sharon Osbourne's father. <gasps> the guy who, like, let dogs out on her when she was prego? Exactly, that guy. So these are the type of people that run the music business, still to this day, mobsters, gangsters. Gosh. And this Michael Jeffrey guy fit in perfect with that crew. And he even proved himself to head honcho Don Arden by stealing the animals from Don. Ooh. So this guy was no stranger to getting his hands dirty. He was embezzling money. He had, you know, all these foreign bank accounts. And all of his accounting was done in Russian so that he couldn't be audited. Uh. And you got to imagine, okay? Hendrix came from America as a nobody. What would you do? Wouldn't you sign the dotted line and not read the whole contract? Right. And he's slapping you with money? By towards the end of his career, Hendrix was earning $100,000 per show. And still broke because Michael Jeffrey kept him high out of his mind and kept him touring and exhausted. So any free time that Hendrix had, he was either writing music or, you know, probably trying to get high to get more out of touch with what was really going on. Right. So Hendrix, he's starting to get fed up with it. He disbands the Hendrix Experience, the Jimi Hendrix Experience group. The group that Jeffrey put together. The group that Jeffrey invested all the money into. So Jeffrey feels that Jimmy's slipping away. Mm. So he starts doing things like setting up a kidnapping for, for Jimi Hendrix. And then he goes in and rescues Hendrix. He set up the whole thing, you know? That's an old school pimp tactic. Exactly. Exactly. And so he's doing these things to make Jimmy feel like he needs Jeffrey. That he owes some sort of loyalty to him because he saved his life. Absolutely. That's what the game is. Right. And so he's, you know, drowning every penny he can from him. And at that time, Hendrix, he's in New York and stuff, and he's hanging out with guys like Miles Davis, who's been in the business a long time. He's been in the business longer than Hendrix at that time. And so Miles Davis starts telling him, hey, why don't you come to my manager? You know, we'll treat you right. I know the game. Come over here. Hendrix considers it. He's heavily considering it. And word starts to get back to Jeffrey that he's considering it. It's a small mm -hmm. business, you know. Mm -hmm. At the top, it's really small. And Miles probably had a pretty good idea just from looking at Hendrix of what was going on. Right, and a lot of his people around him knew what was going on. 
like his drummer that replaced the original drummer, uh, Buddy Miles. He claims to have seen Michael Jeffrey put bad acid in Hendrix's cup before he went on stage. And Hendrix passed out. Oh, gosh. And Noel Redding, the bass player, who died broke. In his book, said that it's highly probable that Michael Jeffrey killed Hendrix. And probably actually did, but he was saying probable because he didn't want any issues on his own back. Right? He kind of had to keep clean too, yeah. you know? It's like there's a hush-hush in the game because if you say too much, you'll be the next target. Oh, yeah, 100%. You know, I made you. I brought you up. You owe me everything. Gosh. You sold your soul to me. Right. And so in these contracts, they're set up to screw over the musician. Oh, yeah. When a label hands an artist a contract, it's basically the label's ultimate wish list. And artists, especially back then, Jimmy, do you think he had a lawyer for his first contract? <laughs> no. And so there's things in there like what we call the death clause. And that means... That the label or the manager or whoever's paying all the money has a life insurance policy out on the artist. And there's times when an artist might be worth more dead than they are alive. That should not be allowed. Right. It's absolutely insane. I mean, that's slavery. It is. Isn't it? Yeah. These are people. They're not products, you know? So Michael Jeffrey has this insurance policy on Hendrix. He knows Hendrix is going to leave. If Hendrix leaves successfully to Miles Davis's uh, management, then they will get all the accounting. They will get all the records of Michael Jeffries. And what's going to happen? Michael Jeffrey would have been exposed for years of embezzlement. And he probably would have ended up in prison. And probably all of his connections that were most likely in on it too, which could have led back to that uh, intelligence agency. Oh, absolutely. And the thing about that, right, is that they all protect each other. Mm -hmm. They protect each other. So the guys that are way up, they know everybody. They know all the police. They know, you know everyone who runs the, the government and who runs the hospitals. So they can get their narrative across when they commit a murder. Gangster Gosh. tactics. Oh, yeah. It's still going on to this day. Gosh, it goes so deep. And so check this out, okay? Let's go back into how he died. When the medics got there, they didn't even know it was Jimi Hendrix. For hours, they thought it was just another black man who overdosed. Once they finally found out, and they get word from the doctor, the doctor says someone had to have poured red wine down his throat when he was highly intoxicated on barbiturates and he had been so intoxicated with barbiturates that he drowned the doctor had a metal rod trying to get all of the liquid out of hendrix till finally he just gave up because there was so much because there was so much and it was so clogged yeah if he was drinking that it would have made it to his gut Right. The doctor said that there was no alcohol content in his bloodstream. Crazy. And all of Hendrix's friends say he didn't drink red wine. Makes sense. You know, he was a big boozer. He was an acid guy. Right. Those don't go good together. Like he was into the sleeping pills and, you know, obviously he did everything, which made him have this crazy tolerance. But the thing about these guys, like him and Kurt Cobain their drug tolerance was so high. It was almost like they couldn't OD. You couldn't kill them with the drugs. Right. They just got them so out of it that you could do whatever you needed to do. So that's really interesting that you say that because that makes me think of what you said earlier about Michael Jeffrey, you know, working Hendrix practically to death. Meanwhile, supplying him with so many drugs that he was completely out of touch with reality. Do you think that Michael Jeffrey 
almost did this intentionally, supplying him with all these drugs and almost making him into this drug addict that we all kind of think of Hendrix to be, building his character to be that so that when he does overdose, no one really questions it. Oh, absolutely. He wanted full control over Hendrix. So if he did have to take him out, again, oh, he's a druggie. Of course he's going to die. Right, of course. And rumor has it that Hendrix actually didn't know a whole lot about drugs. Like one time they asked him, hey, do you want to do some acid? And he said, nah, but do you have any LSD? I prefer LSD. Oh, man. That That's just, how naive he was. That just goes to show you how much it was being pushed down his throat. It was everywhere. And everyone was doing it, too. Of course. So it was real easy to just take that to the next level. While well, no one was looking, everyone's getting high. But Hendrix, a little bit more high than everybody else. So that he had complete control. Absolute complete control over Hendrix. Same thing that pimps do to hookers. Exactly. And that's like a pimp sees his hooker trying to go to another pimp. Oh, she's She's, she's gone. Done. And so Michael Jeffrey was not going to allow Hendrix to switch management. Yeah. It's something that people don't question. We're just, oh yeah, Hendrix died of a drug overdose because he was a big druggie. Don't do drugs, kids. Purple haze. Ha ha ha. We got to always question everything. Right, especially when there's money involved. A lot of money. Yeah, and you know, that's what this podcast is about. It's to start a conversation of rock and roll. This isn't a history lesson. We want to know, okay, if I got some facts wrong, let me know in the comments. I welcome that. Right. Or if you have a different opinion, let us know. You know, we're in there replying... Because that's what it's about, starting a conversation about rock and roll and, you know, keeping the fire alive. Right. So that just makes me wonder, who's this girl that he was with that night? So the girl he was dating at that time, she was actually the one supposedly supplying him with the barbiturates. And she was a well-known, like, kind of groupie in the music industry. That sounds so sticky. Absolutely. And so she drove him to a friend's house early in the morning, about 2 a.m. I don't know whose house this was. I don't have information on where she left him, who he saw there. Brought him back at 3 a.m. And the paramedics said by the time they found him, he had been dead for hours. What? Hours. Wow. And after the paramedics took his body, they raided the house took all of Jimmy's stuff, all the drugs, no evidence. And there was no case that was opened by the police. Gosh, they're in on it with his friend, Michael Jeffries. Exactly. And that is the whole music industry is bribery. In order to get your song on the radio, bribery. So they know the tactic. Go down to the old police force and slip them, slip them a note. 100%. I mean, this guy had money, buku amounts of money. Money and connections. I mean, he used to work with the intelligence agency. He was literally a spy. So could Jimi Hendrix have lived to see today? Let us know what you guys think in the comments. Do you think this is just a big conspiracy? Do you think there's some merit to this? All right, you guys, if you've enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. That's right. And we've got another video popping on the screen now for you guys. Check out our channel. Check out our music. Goza.